All right. Well, welcome, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Karen Strauss, a senior researcher uh, in the Quantum Group, and today is my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor George. Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Just throw caution to the wind. <laughs> George Ambrosiadis. Okay, I hope I didn't butcher it. That, that's perfect. Um, and uh, he's from uh, CMU. He's a research assistant professor at CMU and got his PhD at uh, Toronto. So with that, welcome, George. Well, thank you very much. Okay, so um, as Karen mentioned, like I'm, I'm a research assistant professor in CMU and I just started about like January. But you'll be hearing about all the stuff that are going on right now. Like I feel we're in full swing already. Uh, mostly working in the DOE. And what we're trying to do, and what I'll be talking about today, is we're trying to build sort of a software infrastructure for exascale computing. Right? That's what's going on right now. And um, if you've been looking at the news recently, you probably run into this. I think this is from June 8th from Wired. Um, apparently, the US is back on the top five um, of the biggest supercomputers. This is Summit. Um, it was built for Oak Ridge uh, National Labs from IBM, I think. Um, and it's interesting because it's a mix of like Haswell, I think, CPU, Xeons of some sort, um, and GPUs, like V100 Teslas, right? And Power9, Power9, yes, yeah. thank you, absolutely. That's a great way to start. Um, <laughs> so, um, the, but it's the interesting thing is that it's a mix of like GPUs and CPUs, right? And this is what we're seeing in general. We have to get used to this heterogeneity because it's happening all the time. And it's, it follows a trend that we've, we're sort of used to by now, right? So that um, there's an exponential growth in data, everyone knows that, but also in compute. It doesn't just happen, um, it's planned, as in, um, so this is, what I, what I did here is that I went to the top 500 supercomputers um, for every year from 1993 until today, grabbed only the number one, right? And when I plot the, the blue line is the performance, as in like the number of petaflops, those are hundreds of million of billion uh, floating point operations, so 10 to the 17, I think. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so that's the performance of the blue line. And so for those of you who have been around long enough to remember these names, like Blue Gin L, um, at, I think Lawrence Livermore, Roadrunner were some of the sort of US supercomputers that made it to the top one. And then the past few years, since 2013 or so, China held like the first spot with Sunway Taihu Light. Um, and so Summit is where we are right now, right, from with Oak Ridge. And this is going to continue, by the way, right? So the ECP is the Exascale Compute project that is driven by the DOE right now. And they're trying to build an Exascale cluster. So Summit is delivering about 200 petaflops right now. Um, we're hoping to get to an exaflop by 2021 or 2022. Um, and it might be Argon and Ar uh, uh, Aurora, I think, is going to be the name, at Argon National Labs that are going to do that. Um, so. The interesting thing here is that when you look at how um, they build those supercomputers, what you need to be prepared for is millions of cores, and they're going to be heterogeneous. So it's the sort of the many core era thing where you have low frequency, you have high bandwidth memory attached to them. It's not all going to be the usual CPUs that we're, the, you know, the homogeneous systems that we're used to. Um, simulations that run on these machines produce in the order of exabytes of data. We've recently produced like petabytes of a single job, so this is the amount of data that we're looking at. And the cluster itself is made up of a lot of nodes, so about tens of thousands usually. So these are the systems that we're working with. And so in this space, sort of the challenges that I see that excite me about this is, first of all, it's hard to configure operating systems um, at this scale. And the reason I say this is because it's hard to optimize an operating system knobs that might be exposed for all possible applications that run on them. So you, have, you might be doing training, AI on them, but at the same time, you might be doing climate modeling. And so tightly coupled applications. So it's hard to do things like, you know, if you, if you look at a storage perspective alone and you have a parallel file system, it's hard to say how many metadata servers do you want for your parallel file system, right? Some workloads are more metadata heavy than others. Um, what is the optimal data layout for your data so you can do analysis really fast? That's also hard. And so the approach that we're taking and sort of the work I'll be talking about looks at letting, sort of exposing all these mechanisms to applications and letting them decide. So I say application here, that doesn't mean the programmer has to do this work. It could be some sort of library in the, in the user level, right? And so that's what I'll be talking about, or service at the user level. But it's important to sort of expose that so you can have diversity, or so you can accommodate the diversity. The second part is just the pure administrative burden of having like those tens of thousands of nodes and all those jobs running on them, 
right? We just recently were looking at a trace that had hundreds of thousands of, jo of jobs like in the order of a month. And that's a lot for HPC, by the way. That's not a lot for a conventional cluster outside of HPC. We're talking about long jobs here. Um, so if you're going to look at anything like, is there interesting patterns in the workload? Is work being lost because we have failures? It's hard to see trends across the workload. So um, that's one thing that we need to be able to detect and inform administrators, um, detect bad usage patterns like users that are using the system in a specific way. Um, and what we're doing here is we're trying to take data that is collected anyway in these systems, like historical data, like sensor data, and learn from that. So this leads me to the first part. I was talking about exposing mechanisms letting the application decide. The project that I'm going to be talking about here is called DeltaFS. This is a usual level distributed file system um, that we're building at CMU. We've built at CMU, and we keep building. Um, it's a collaboration with Los Alamos and Argon, um, and it's, it's a big team made up of people in all of those uh, places. So here's a, what we're, like, I'll give you an example. Yes? So you were talking about, uh, could you go back one more? Yes. So challenges at exos, uh, exascale. Yeah. These are uh, like a small subset, right? There's like yeah. Absolutely. a bunch There's of other massive challenges. <laughs> yes. Like, you know, constant failures and those kinds of things. Absolutely. How do those compare to these challenges? Well, we need to be able to detect those failures before they happen potentially, right? If you see that a certain job has a certain um, behavior over time, um, you should be able to see, or a specific user is part of, is having like a debug cycle, for example. You should be able to see that and say, there's going to be a failure now, and it's expected because it's part of a debug cycle. Or there's a failure that's going to happen is because this node is bad. Um, things like that that we can glean from the data. Um, but I'm not saying that these are the two, the be all and end all of like challenges in X scale. These are the challenges that I see as like things that I want to focus on with my work right now. Mm -hmm. um, there's others, but I think the failures that you mentioned. They're sort of part of what we're looking at here, and I'll get to that in the second part of the talk. Mm -hmm. Just to add to what Ricardo was saying, yeah. there's a ton of networking challenges too. Absolutely. It's not going to be an exascale cluster if you're not if you haven't figured out how to totally. move packets around. Yes. So I should I should change the name of that slide to my challenges at exascale. <laughs> like the, the challenges that I'm excited about at exascale. But I mean, that, so the thing is, it's hard to sort of separate them, though, right? Because what you said is a, a valid problem. When we're trying to um, expose or like have a distributed file system at user level, we need to make sure we use the network as efficiently as possible. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about that. I'm not, we're not networking people like primarily, so you know, like there might be other ways we can exploit it. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk about in-situ computation, things you can do in programmable NICs potentially. But anyway, yes. I'll get to that. Um, yeah, so, so Delta FS. Let me give you an example um, of sort of a scientific workflow and the challenges that we see here. Um, so this is a simulation of turbulent flow. Well, it's a simulation of air particles moving through a landing gear of an airplane, right? And so this is the output of a simulation across 2,300 cores or so. And so what I want to, if I can pause it right here. Um, so what you see here is that the collars in this false collar movie could be, for example, the energy or the temperature of each one of the particles. And this is what the scientist gets when the simulation is done. The way that this is constructed is that uh, you do computation, you stop the computation, you do I.O., and that I.O. essentially is one frame of this movie. Right? So um, essentially, that's the step one for a simulation. You cycle between computation and I.O. Um, and the, problem, the first problem here is that when you're moving to like millions of cores, um, typically how this output is happening is that you have one file per core. Um, and every core for every frame will output a separate file. Right? So they'll write all of that to the parallel file system. So we're talking about like millions of metadata operations right now hitting the metadata servers of the parallel file system. So that's the first problem. The second thing that happens is that you want to do analysis on this data, but when you output the data, it could be outputted out of order. And typically that's how it happens because we want to get it on storage as fast as possible. Um, so as soon as you want to do analysis, you might want to reorder the data. And so they do a huge sort operation as soon as the job is done over like hundreds of terabytes or petabytes of data right now. Um, and so they, they used to do this on a separate cluster. It used to be the case that in HPC uh, environments, you'd have the capability or the compute clusters, and then you'd have like the viz clusters. So those would be clusters you allocate just to do essentially, well, Maybe sort makes it sound simpler than it is, but any kind of analysis, post-processing analysis. Um, yeah. 
So when you talk about your scientific workflows, are those are those offline applications or are those online and, and real time applications? Are you talking about uh, well, so what kind of applications? For that specific one, one yeah. it is offline a thing. Okay, so you generate the entire simulation and yeah. then someone sort of like plays it on their video player or something like that. Is yes. That right. So if I understand your term of what offline and online means is that there's no real time that while the simulation is happening, exactly. right now, That's they're right. not changing anything dynamically. Okay. Yeah. I'm not saying that should, that is not possible. Hopefully we can do this in the future. Okay. Um, or you can embed things in the pipeline that sort of say, oh, something interesting is happening, output more data. Okay. Or like, nothing interesting is happening, don't output anything, yeah, that's keep going. Yeah. Not yet, but like, you're on something here, but okay. we're trying to work on that, yes. Do you have any intuition as to why they would generate one file per frame? Um, I, th I think it was the easiest thing for them to do. I don't know. Um, they, there's other types of output. They've explored a lot of different things. If you look at the literature for HPC, like for example, there's the HDF5 library is one that is used popularly. Like it's a popular library to output a specific format for scientific data, so they can trade them between labs. Um, and that creates one file. But even if that, in that one file, every process writes a specific offsets. So it's essentially similar to this model. Uh, I think it's just that they're trying to reduce interference between them. Because that does produce an enormous amount of metadata operations. Yes. Yeah. Seemingly for no reason, right? But yeah. Are you saying that this that um, this sort of like organizing all these billions of output files is happening just at the end of this process or at the end of every compute frame? At the end of the whole process, the whole simulation. Okay. And it used to be the case that it will happen in a separate cluster even, right? That would read from that parallel file system and reorder everything and write it back. Um, well, why isn't it happening at the at, at every I/O step? Good point. So um, if it was happening at every so so as you as a scientist you get like say twelve hours in a supercomputer, right? Um, if you were to do any additional work when you're doing I/O, you'd be wasting essentially that time that is given to you not doing compute. So, you, so um, you're sorting at the end over like not like over like time and over all the yeah like distributed yeah. So you well. You don't because the individual files correspond. What well, each one of them corresponds to a frame. Oh, so you don't. You already have, you don't have to do that if you don't want to, right? Yeah. So the sort depends on what kind of queries you want to run. Um, so I try not to oversimplify what's happening here, but at the same time, not throw all the details out there and make it too complicated. Um, but yeah, the, the, there's the, they have this golden rule that like the I/O that happens should be less than ten percent of the total time of your job, so that at least ninety percent of the time is used doing actual computation. So that has led them to do a lot of interesting things. They decide to buy more SSDs, for example, because they want to uh, make that uh, time smaller. Um, so that's, that's really important for them to keep it as short as possible. So it seems like there's, there's a trade-off between storage and computation and yeah. growing storage so they can do more computation. And then dealing yes, with the problem. Yes, but at the same time you have this problem that I mean, compute is the main thing that you're planning for when you're budgeting for a supercomputer. Then what's left has to go to storage, and then you have to decide, am I going to have more capacity on disks, or am I going to have more IOPS on SSD? And so they, that's a very sensitive sort of trade-off they have to make. And so now, right now, the latest supercomputers they're putting together is a mix of both, where you have like one or two times the memory. So one of the supercomputers we're playing with is like Trinity, which is the largest one of Los Alamos. And that's like, that's kind of about, one and a half petabytes of RAM and about three petabytes of SSDs. Um, but that's, they wanted to have more than that. So you can output like multiple checkpoints, but the, you can't afford that. At that point, you have to shrink your actual storage. Yes. Oh, so I just wanted to say, uh, I'm an undergraduate student at Vanderbilt University doing HPC research, and I can maybe shed some insight into the question asked two ago about why scientists use this workflow. Um, so I work on density functional theory codes for quantum simulation written in Fortran. And we use exactly this workflow because IO in Fortran really sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to do it in a non-trivial way. Um, so we just like dump a big array out to disk every frame um, because doing anything more sophisticated would take time away from doing more science in an already yeah. archaic dinosaur language. That, why are you no using Fortran? Uh, because the code was started like a couple decades ago, yeah. and is still maintained to this day. Um, I can ask you a different question right on that. Like, would you like to be the person that changed a 30-year-old code that um, maintains a nuclear stockpile? <laughs> that I mean, the person I mean, that wrote there it exists. An engineer who would be willing to do that. Hopefully. Okay. I'm, I'm with but, you on uh, that. Um, uh, there does not appear to exist an undergraduate who's willing to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully, we can get to that at some point. Anyway, um, 
a lot of interesting things that I could mention here, but I sort of have to like distance myself from money continue because I'm never going to be done otherwise. So data querying. Um, primarily what happens in data querying is that you do this on one attribute, right? Something like the energy of a particle. And the reason for that is because there's high selectivity for those queries. So if you say, give me all the particles that had energy more than, I don't know how many, um, electrovolts, you basically go from like trillions of particles to like a couple million or like tens of millions, and that fits in memory, and then you can do whatever else you want in memory. Um, so we want to basically be able to deal with those uh, tons of metadata operations, not waste resources for that post-processing, and keep like analysis like queries being low latency. Right? And on top of that, I'm going to throw this thing that, like this anecdote of what happened to us. Something like that. someone from uh, Los Alamos called us a cos cosmologist. His name is Fan Gul. This is actually him. Um, and he told us that I'm trying to simulate um, turbulent flow, which is a particle workload. So you have particles moving around in space. Um, and so you have trillions of particles. And what I do is I create one file per particle. Um, I output, I append to that file every time I do I.O. Um, so you have trillions of tiny appends at every time that I.O. thing is happening. So you have a storm of metadata operations. And I do this because you told me that when I'm done, I can read a file sequentially and it's going to be fast. And it's not. Why? Um, so our initial reaction was that maybe we shouldn't help him. We should just tell him to do things in a different way. But then I thought, oh, this might be an interesting research problem. So we managed to accommodate that workload as well as, as the process of this. So how do we do that? Um, this is where DeltaFS comes in. Um, it's a distributed file system as a service at the user level. The first thing we do is you need to decide how to allocate resources to the file system. How many metadata servers do you want? Because the file system is a service, essentially a library that could be linked into the application process, you decide how many processes of your application want to basically be also metadata servers. So how do we distribute also the load across those metadata servers? Is that we take the namespace and we shard it essentially across those processes, right? So that means we, we're moving away from a synchronous namespace at this point to an asynchronous one where every process is in charge of parts of it. Um, this is okay for scientific applications because like you do all of your writes and like no one's actually going to look at the data until that I.O. process is done. Your queries are going to come in later for the data. Um, so you can choose to do your synchronization in bulk later on between the processes. And that doesn't limit you in that you can have more frequent synchronization, but then you can end up having the performance of a regular parallel file system right now. And we sort of want to avoid that. Um, I'm not going to be talking so much about that today um, as, as another part of it, which is just avoiding the post-processing altogether. Right? Um, and at the same time, not increasing that I.O. time. So the way we do this is we want to do indexing on streaming data. Right? So the, the main idea here is that as you're pushing terabytes or petabytes of data to storage, the compute is just sitting idle there waiting for storage to absorb all that data. Um, and so we could use that. We could look at the data as it streams to storage and build indices on it. Even if it's not perfect, it's fine. You can tack it onto the data. And then later on, instead of doing post-processing, you just look at those indices and you find where your data is. Right? So I'm going to focus on talking about that for the remainder of this part of the talk. Right? And especially, how do we do this without actually taking resources out, away from the application? So when we talk to physicists, they told us, we're willing to give you like 3% of memory maybe at all times. Right? Because the, the point here is, if I have to swap out data of the application to do my indexing or buffer things, that sort of defeats the purpose. Right? We're trying to get all the data storage anyway. Um, so we allocate a part of the memory, and that's basically our buffers to do all this indexing. So how does it work? Um, we do this thing that we call an index massive directory. So we're not changing the code right, at all of the application. What they do is that when they want to output a lot of particles, for example, every other directory works like a normal directory in a file system. But then you have those special directories that you do a make dir and you put a special flag in it. That's basically all they have to do. Um, and initially what we had, this is the model we had before, right? You have millions of processes. Each one writes a separate file. The data they write, there's no order. Right? It really depends. Is the particle with me now? Did it move to another process and get outputted there? That's really how the order is determined. Um, and all those files are outputted directly as objects to storage or like as files to the parallel file system. And then if you want to do a query, you have to look through all of them or do a sort and then look um, specifically in certain parts of that, offsets of that. So what we do instead is this. You have millions of processes, but each one now as a server, each one of the, of the processes that is a server of, the, of our user level distributed file system is now in charge of a range of keys. Um, so this doesn't have to be particles, it could be keys and values. Um, and so 
basically every time you're about to do a write, you do the shuffle um, through the network and you, you have to evolve to all communication. We'll talk about how you scale that later on. Um, but basically you get to um, the process that's in charge of that range of keys and that process puts logs together only for that range of keys. So that you do a pre-sort at this point, but you still have things out of order within that log of that one process, right? So what happens at that point is that within that buffer of that process, you receive par uh, keys of a specific range, you build a bloom filter, right? And that bloom filter basically says, I'll take 3% of memory, partition into like one half and one half of a percent, which is roughly like 16 megs if you assume like four gigabytes of RAM per core, which is typically what you see in those machines. Um, and I'm gonna freeze this, sort it, so for those of you who, are, like, who know about log structure of merge trees and like sort of string tables that Google uses for that, um, so SSDs are essentially like a small chunk of data that is sorted based on their keys. And so you have a bloom filter that says this SSD contain, may contain your key. And you output those chunks out. So when you're about to do your query, you know, I never follow my slides. Um, so when you, follow, when, you, when you do a query, you essentially go to the logs of the process that's in charge of the key range that you're looking for. You look through their bloom filters and that limits you to like a certain set of SSDs. Could be more than you need, that's still fine. Um, that you need to fetch in order to find your data. And then you do a binary search within that SSD, which are typically tiny. So you need to search basically megabytes to find like a specific key as opposed to like do a sort. And as I mentioned, we do this with 3% of memory. I mean, we're not locked to 3%. There's nothing magic that has, that's happening at 3% that can't happen at 5 or it can't happen at 1. Just like if you, if you change this, uh, what, you're, what you'd expect to find is like more SSDs you need to look for, so bigger indices potentially. Because don't forget, like we're using the bandwidth of storage at 100%. So any index we put in is going to slow us down. So we need to compress our indices as well. Um, so if you're going to have smaller like SSDs, you're going to use more, less memory at runtime. You're going to have to output more indices. You might have to increase your I.O. time. Anyway, maybe I'm getting into too much details. I should show you the good stuff. So query time, it's fast. How fast? I should explain what the baseline means here. We try to create an adversary here, like a baseline that's better than what you typically see and that like, we give them the benefit of the doubt in that um, here's how our baseline works. You scan all of the data in parallel once to find certain keys. Right, so this is one scan. If you did an actual sort, you know there's no way to like, do this with like, just a single pass over the data. And on top of that, we use every single process that was available to the computation to look at chunks of the data in parallel. So it doesn't really get better than this. You wouldn't do this in reality because if you had to do this for every query, it would take a very long time, as you can see. So it takes like for one node, and these are like small experiences that we ran in last year, or well, not last year, but like close to last year. Um, so we started with one node where it was like, a few seconds to look through all the data, and then we went to 99 nodes. As you increase the nodes, the simulation size increases too. So at this point, we had 49 billion particles, right, and that many files. Um, and at this point, it takes like close to like 20 minutes or so. Is this is distributed. This is distributed. Yeah, it's about 32 cores per node. Um, so what I want, what I wanted to emphasize here, this is a full system parallel scan. Every single core is is part of this, this query in that it, it's assigned a certain part of the data and it looks only for the particles in that. So with TiltFS, it's a lot faster because we don't have to look through all the data. Depending on the size of your query, how many particles you're looking at, like basically you're only gonna look through that many indices and it doesn't matter how much data you have. All it matters is just you know, that one lookup that you're doing. So of course like our speed up increases as the size of the data increases. And this is like a modest size simulation. We'll get to bigger. Um, I'm just, like right now, I think the biggest one we did was 4,000 nodes, 128,000 cores. So I'll get to that a bit later. Um, but at this point, we were, we were already like 5,000 fa times faster than having to do that sort in the end. Because one thing I didn't mention before is that because of the budgeting constraints and putting together supercomputers today, because we need to keep them growing, um, those viz clusters they used to have, they're not around anymore, right? That's the first thing that got knocked off. And so they merged that budget into building the actual supercomputer and they told scientists if you need to do any post-processing, it's on you, right? You have to take time off your simulation on the actual supercomputer. Um, so this is why this becomes important. Why is there a difference between one node and between baseline and you? Uh, why is there a difference between one node, one node. in one node between delta FS yeah. and the baseline? Because uh, baseline is still looking through all the data. 
we're only looking at the index and we single out most of the SSDs. Right? So we only look at a specific chunk of the data that might contain your key as opposed to all of it. So you mean one compute in order? So the exception yes. of the number one of compute, compute nodes. nodes. Yes. And so that's why I put these labels here, because like if you see the simulation side, it's confusing. But and what about, the, what about your, your storage? Was that constant throughout? throughout all yes, your so this is the same parallel file system. It's a luster parallel file system. Okay. Um, and, and the number of SSDs were also constant throughout. throughout yes, our actually, wait, system, right? this is a good point. For th this was run on Trinity, um, their supercomputer, and this was actually never touched spinning disks. This was all on SSDs. Okay. So these are distributed SSDs. They have the, the three petabytes that I mentioned before. Okay. Uh, we never actually staged out to Luster because it's going to get slower when you do that. And, and we have to do that for bigger simulations. And the size and the number of SSDs stay constant as you move through the x-axis. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, yes and no. So so this is where reading the paper is actually going to give you a lot more information okay. than I can do here. But basically, we try to make sure there's a the ratio is the same. All right. What I mean by that is that there's one burst buffer no well, one SSD node, if you will, because they have specific I.O. nodes that contain those SSDs. There's one of them that gets allocated per six nodes or so. That's right. the ratio. Okay. Okay. So as we go to bigger nodes, we increase... That scales out for Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. The best part is that you do this with single CPU core, because you just have to look through indices, right? So you can do this on your laptop, potentially. Oh, okay. If it's connected to that parallel file system. Um, so the trade-off here is that 5000x speed up that I, that I show here for some slowdown in runtime, and I'm going to talk about more about that now, that you saw the good result, um, which is about 5 to 6 percent overhead in time across the entire simulation. So I want to do this shout out here and our collaborators uh, at Argon uh, and Los Alamos and HTF, actually. Um, so this is part of a bigger project. Well, Delta Fest used components that were part of a bigger project that they were collaborating. Uh, with them on. And that's called the Mochi Project. This is essentially about building services in user level um, that will be able to provide things like, for example, um, Mercury is something we use a lot. And this is like our communication service. And it can do RPCs and RDMAs, depending on the size of the, of the communication, um, over like different transports, right? From TCP to like using the actual um, like an, um, libverbs or whatever they have there. Because the thing is, for those supercomputers, most of the time, Cray develops the, the um, network um, portion of that. Um, so, and they interconnect. So it's something that's proprietary, and they know how to build the right transport that you know, works well and at scale um, on the supercomputer like that. So we leverage a service like that to do most of our communications. There's lightweight user level threads um, as another service that they distribute or distributed object stores. Right, so, so we're part of this project, and we're sort of like using all these services to put together Delta Fest, so we don't have to implement the entire stack at the scale that we're going at. Right, when you want to do 4,000 um, nodes, for example. Okay, so I mentioned before that we actually went to 128,000 nodes. We did, and that's a paper that's going to appear at Supercomputing in November, so it just got accepted. Um, and there's certain lessons we learned. So the trend that you saw before sort of holds um, to 128,000 cores, um, I still haven't talked about slowdown. But before I do this, what I want to mention is there's certain caveats to DeltaFS right now that is basically current work. Um, the first thing is that partitioning that I mentioned of the key ranges. Um, so if you have something like usual particle simulations, it works great. Um, and that basically the data per particle is constant. Um, and so you can partition your keys. And you know, if, you, if you give a certain range of, if the range of keys is the same in terms of size across cores, the load is the same. As soon as you get to things like, let's say you want to do something interesting that people are not really doing right now, but you can imagine them doing if they had the ability, is say, for example, you have a contour of a space where you have the temperature of different particles. And over the course of the simulation, you start with something that's cold, and you have hotter areas that develop over time, and then they become cold again. Right? So if you have an individual file per temperature range, then you have to do some load balancing here, because that key is going to receive more data as the simulation uh, progresses. Right? You can imagine this happening with other features, potentially. Like if you have certain keys that become hot partway through your workload and then they become cold again, you have to deal with that. Right now, we offload this to the hash function to decide that. And try to, we, like, we're also looking at ways to do this by changing our shuffle to essentially reassign key ranges dynamically. Um, so the other thing is doing all-to-all -all communication is fine when you're dealing with hundreds of cores. As soon as we got to like 128,000, the amount of state, I think 120,000 squared is like 16.3 billion or something like that. Um, so that's how many 
open connections you have to maintain if you want to want to do all to all. So instead, what we decided to do is we had for those runs we had this multi-hop routing, essentially routing tables per core. So you have delegates in every node that know to, to contact other nodes. So essentially, all the all the communication that has to go to a specific node is directed to another core, and so the buffers there collect that uh, information, and send it over. And you have to keep a lot less memory state around to do that. So that three percent, we can still make that happen at that scale. Um, and we described that in the paper that's going to be coming out. So in terms of indexing, there's a couple other things. Uh, that might seem a little bit more obvious. The first thing is that picking the index key is very important. As I mentioned before, this links back to the hash function. That as soon as you've picked your index key and, and we're done, uh, you can do very fast queries on that index key. If you decide to change your queries over time to something else, from energy to temperature or from energy to velocity or whatever, um, there's going to be a problem. Right? Then you have to sort again. That's not something that was solved in the baseline and we didn't solve. You still would have to sort the data again. But you know, we're thinking about alternatives like, is it possible that you build new indices over time as you look at the queries coming to you and you're reading the data? Um, is there a way to re do any reorganization? Um, and you know, build secondary indices, tertiary indices, things like that. There's a slowdown. Um, so the, the key thing that we had to do, we had to spend a lot of our time doing engineering to basically overlap um, I.O. with network communication with compute that is happening. Right? Because there's a network communication of the shuffling, moving things around. But then as soon as you get everything to the node and you need to push it out to storage, you still need to compress it. So there's computation that needs to happen. Compute the bloom, the, the bloom filter that I mentioned and push everything out to storage. So you have to overlap all these things carefully. Um, and again, in the paper we talk in, in that uh, in a lot more detail that I can cover here. But there was a lot of time that was spent doing that. Because um, essentially what you want to do is keep storage 100% utilized at all times. That's really the key. Um, the interesting thing is that we managed to do this with using only 50% of Haswell uh, CPUs that we had available to us. This opens up the door to doing other things, potentially. In addition to doing indexing, we might be able to do um, more rigorous compression. We might be able to do encryption or other things that you might want to do, like apply some sort of filtering function there. So this is what we call in situ computation, essentially. You could do all of that in those nodes because we have more compute to do that. Now, if you go to like other things, like Trinity is a hybrid supercomputer in that it's made up of KNLs, Knights Landing, uh, Intel Phi's. I'm, I'm not going to talk about Intel Phi's right now, but basically they're like part of that many core thing of like lower frequency. Um, they have high bandwidth memory attached to it that has very high latency. And so as soon as we ported our code to that portion of the supercomputer, it was a lot harder to do what we like. This overlapping essentially starts breaking, right? Because you have a lot more compute available to you, but the storage bandwidth is the same. So there's going to be an additional paper that comes out on how to do that. And I, I'd like to see Delta FS move in a space where it doesn't really matter what kind of architecture you have under you. You'd be able to adapt to the available compute you have. Um, but it's not quite there yet. So slow down. Okay. I didn't talk about slow down yet. Yeah. And, and what I'm going to be doing is talk about slow down in the context of how much you slow down your I.O. phase. Right? Yes. Before you move on. Abstractly indexing things and then searching for the right index feels like something that Google is doing for indexing their documents on the entire internet. Yeah. Do you have any insights of how similar or different they are and you can use the same techniques? We used to, so the first time we submitted a paper on this, this supercomputing, we talked about a map reduce pipeline because mm -hmm. um, it's similar. You do a lot of filtering and things like on the node that it doesn't have a lot of dependencies on the data you're looking at. And um, so this, this shuffling is essentially our mapping. Mm -hmm. um, and that didn't go over well because like, they just looked too much into that uh, comparison. But yes, there's similarities in there that we, um, we, we look at simple, like the, the, um, the characteristics of a map computation, essentially, of a subtle computation, of the reduced computation could be mapped to like, the types of in-situ computation that we're looking at here. I don't think we're far enough. Um, to be able to abstractly look at types of computation yet. Mm -hmm. So our indexing is deeply embedded within the pipeline right now. Right? And we're trying to do like we're trying to have multiple scientific applications work with our pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, but what I want to do eventually is have something like that where essentially you have this map function or whatever and you define it and you find the right interface um, to be able to have the, the scientists write that computation and do that. Mm -hmm. um, we're not there yet. Uh, and I don't know if like the map reduce interface is going to be the exact same, but this is something that I'm grappling with right now, and I'm trying to see how similar we are to that. 
I think we are similar to that. We're doing a lot more data at a more fine-grained scale, potentially, but yeah. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. yeah. But uh, is the set of queries you want to run on a particular simulation fixed, or is it like you want to change the queries based on what kind of queries you executed? Because if, if you envision me pushing queries down to the, to the simulation phase, uh, you will still need to write all your you know, data eventually in case you have some other queries that you can't execute at that point, right? So it's not clear whether you can push all the queries down to the simulation. So you might need like a hybrid uh, system where still you have two pipelines, one for in situ processing and back one traditional to enable more scientific applications. It's possible. So, so your initial question was like whether you know the queries that you're sending out yeah. is fixed. Now, um, there in in concept when you ask what people, they'll tell you that yeah, we only query based on energy or whatever, and then like everything else fits in memory, and then we can do whatever we want with simple scripts. Um, the reality of the thing is that it's a lot more arbitrary than that. It's actual scientists looking at the data. Um, so as soon as they see something interesting in a, as a result of a query, they might decide to just, you know, okay. use it. Yeah, it's a lot more interactive at that point. Yeah, so then in that case, how do you envision pushing filtering uh, operators in case that some other query might need to touch other data, right? That You will have to redo your simulation, so you can't afford doing that. Yeah. So you so have to provision for both, then it's given like a, some compute budget, it's going to be like... Let me suggest right. this as an alternative. Why would we have to wait until the simulation is done? Why can't we have this interactive analysis happen as the simulation progresses? Which means that you're looking at part of the data that's being generated and you decide whether it was a good choice to run this specific simulation or this specific workload that you're running with these parameters or you should be changing something about it. Um, this is too far into the future, right? Yeah. But I'd like to be able to see that. And maybe it, this is too fast for a human to process right now um, although they try to do this, um, I, I don't know how much I can say about this. Okay, they try to do this. I'll, I'll, I'll stick to that. Um, but they try to do this like in a way where like you just you have a ring buffer in front of you, imagine, and like data flows through it, and it's up to you to decide if we can if you can write computation that keeps up with that. Um, so they, there's no other guarantee that is given to you. Um, there could be better things that we could do about this, looking at the data and making decisions on that. Um, so we don't, what you're raising is an important issue, right? But that only occurs if you reach the end of the simulation and then you start doing analysis. Yeah. Instead of trying to fix that problem, I'd like to be able to push all of this into the simulation itself. Um, okay, so slow down. Speaking of slow down, um, I'm pretty slow. Um, so slow down, um, the, the way that I'm calculating this here is that it's the slowdown you have only in the I.O. phase, which is like only 10% of your simulation time. Because right, I think it's fair to look at it that way. And so uh, what we have here is the I.O. time that it takes you to output one frame of the, that movie that you saw. And then the number of processes you have here from 32 processes, 32 cores essentially, to 128,000 on Trinity. So these are not simulations, actual runs. Um, this is the baseline. Um, so essentially what you're seeing here is that you start with a small job. And by small job, I mean like 32 cores all the way to, what is this, 1,000? Um, that's a small job um, in that it's still not I.O. bound at this point. It's compute bound, which is why you see an increase in time. As soon as you reach a point where it becomes I.O. bound, it's the same. Um, so because, again, you have more processes outputting to the same parallel file system. So this was the baseline. This is where Delta FS stands right now. So for small jobs, you know, things are you know, a little bit worse here than you would imagine, like, two, like 248 uh, percent faster, like two times slower for each frame. Um, but as soon as you get to larger simulations, we're around 8 to 10 percent. When you get to 64,000 cores, um, it, this was about 18 percent to 35 percent slowdown per IO frame. We were lucky to get time to run these jobs. Um, and we were lucky that they ran and completed with our code. Because again, we're you know, just an academic institution. So um, you know, 35 percent, it's fine. Uh, we could probably optimize our code at that point. But it's not the end of the world because, again, it's 35% slowdown here in terms of only the I.O. time. That's still 5 to 6% slowdown in terms of the entire computation. Okay. Do, do you understand why it starts going on? <laughs> we only got like 24 hours, I think, to run on that supercomputer. But we did one other thing. 
we ran the same experiment without the shuffling. So remember, there's two things. There's a shuffle, like all this all-to-all -all communication, and there's the indexing that has to happen, which is the compute. Um, so we ran with just the compute and didn't do any shuffling. So you just index whatever data you have. That makes no sense. But you still just only do the same computation and push it out. So we're much closer if you only do that. So it might be something in our code that has to do with networking. Um, we don't know yet. But I don't know if we'll have another chance to run 120,000 cores. But um, one thing that came out of this, I think we managed to create a trillion files in like 100 seconds. So Lanel's trying to publish this as a thing, um, as a record of some sort, I don't know. Um, but this is, this is where we stand right now. So, because uh, I should move to the second part of the talk. Um, I, I sort of touched on all of that right now uh, through the talk, like support workload types, like highly variable writes that I mentioned before. Um, having secondary and tertiary indices is something we're looking at. Coordination between jobs I didn't talk about. Um, so if you have multiple jobs that have, want to talk to each other, but you have an asynchronous namespace, that becomes an interesting problem. But we look at jobs that want to do that, and typically it's things like, I'll put a dot .log file in this directory, please don't touch anything. That's the kind of communication that's happening. I'm of the opinion that that's the sort of communication that shouldn't be happening through the file, the file system. This is, like, basically you're using the file system as a communication service, so there should be a communication service for you to do that. Um, could be that dot .log files are detected and you do something else based on that. Um, supporting heterogeneous hardware and backends, like having different types of uh, architectures uh, that give you a different ratio of compute to I.O., or even like going from something like Lustre to like cloud object stores where <coughs> doing tiny writes, like preferring very large writes at the gigabyte scale might be a better thing. Um, so far, um, you haven't touched on heterogeneity, right? Uh, all your file system work was on assuming Haswell. everything was well, I mean, is a nice. We have something for Haswell's right now. We're, we're pushing out a paper. There's work that is ongoing. We have some results. I can't talk about that just now because it's too preliminary. We've been able to replicate our results on like uh, Intel Fives. Um, but what I want is what I haven't talked about is synergy in the sense of like taking the same thing of the same file system and having it run in both Haswells and Fives at the same time and being able to sort of like shift key ranges, potential things like that. We're not there yet. Um, and yeah, I sort of touched on the other stuff. I want to move on in the interest of time to the second part. I talked about sort of trying to administer these big clusters and learning from historical data that you collect from them. Uh, so this is what we call the Atlas Project. This is work, again, with Los Alamos. They're the first to give us data. Um, so they deserve an honorable mention now and forever. Um, and the Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon, this is what, what I call the Atlas Project. Um, so what, when it started, it started, the mandate initially was that we were given data that Lano was using anyway, was collecting anyway. And it was things like job logs uh, from the schedulers, operating system logs, um, sensor data, and they were collecting terabytes per day across all of the clusters they have. And typically the way this was used is it was basically stowed away somewhere and like when something bad happened, the admins would go and triage the problem by looking at all those logs. So the obvious thing to think is why can't we just apply some models, at least machine learning, like see if there's interesting trends. Can you predict something that's about to happen before it happens? Um, so recently, this started with Los Alamos giving us data that's still happening. Like two of my students are now in Los Alamos and one of them is looking at data like this. Um, and there's Two Sigma was one of the companies that joined in since then and they gave us data. Uh, the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center as well. Um, so these are companies where we have the data right now and we're about to publish it. Um, there's others that are, like, we're talking with to like, sort of join that effort. So what is that effort and why does it make sense to have a lot of organizations join? One of the things we wanted, we wanted to do is that we, we realized it's been a while since we've had traces become publicly available. So it's interesting to sort of look at the literature from that angle of last time we had a job log out with like Google publishing a big trace in 2011. And all the literature since then has focused on that one trace. So like how much have we overfit in that workload? Right? So that was the first thing we wanted to look at. Second thing is can you model those workloads and do these predictions that I mentioned before? Events like failures or I'll talk about other types of events that are of interest. Can you predict them in the future? And the third thing, it's very near and dear to my heart, is like having a trace repository for people to use, like for, with traces available for people to use. Um, so what do we have in that repository right now? And you're hearing about it first, because like, I'm going to talk about this in a month at ADC, but um, this is the first time I'm talking about it outside CMU. So we have two sigma has given us two traces from two clusters 
they're, they're, they're uh, similar, the two data centers they have. One's in New York, the other one's in Pittsburgh. As very recently, I was able to actually say the name of the company. Um, so that's also a good thing. Um, so they have a cluster where they're doing business analytics, think Spark. Um, and it's about 1,300 nodes in total, nine months, very recently collected. We have two traces from Lanel. One is from Mustang, which is a general purpose cluster they use, which is available to everyone. It's one of their small ones. It's about 1,600 nodes. Um, the, the great thing about that trace, though, is that it's five years. It's the entire lifetime of the cluster. So it allows you to do sort of longitudinal analysis, look at what happened over the five years. When they ask you, is this representative part of the workload? It is the workload, everything that ran on it. And then the second thing is that we're able to collect a trace from Trinity, which is their largest supercomputer. You can't collect data on that because now it's on the red zone is what they call it, which just means it's just off bounds for collecting any data. It does whatever they're doing on that. Um, but while they're standing up with the entire supercomputer, which is about a million cores, they did it in phases because it's too big. Um, the first phase was putting together about 300,000 Haswell cores, and then they opened it up to scientists to run their workloads. The ones, some of them, what we were told is that they're similar to the workload they would see when it's actually in the red zone. So it's not a completely made up trace. It's actual work they were doing. Um, the difference is that it was open to more groups than it is now um, because they were trying to get as many people to use it as possible. And so we're able to collect about three months of data during that phase. And so the repository, there's something available through projectatlas.org right now. There's more traces that are coming soon. You can contribute to this, right? You could be one of the organizations that are part of this repository. Um, and let me show you what we've done with the data so far and why this is important. So the first thing that I mentioned was looking at overfitting in the literature, right? Right now, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide, but basically all we have is that Google trace that came out in 2011. Um, and I think even Google is not comfortable with us using it anymore. Like I was talking to Joel Wilkes about this, and, and it's just we'd like to basically transition to something better um, and use this as one of many traces. So what we wanted to see is that it's so popular. There's been about 450 publications I could trace down since 2012 is when it was actually publicly released. But how representative is it of all the other clusters we have? And so there's going to be a paper that appears in a month from now, not a month, two weeks at this point, I think, at ADC in Boston. And um, what we did essentially, we took those traces, the, the Google trace, the two Sigma traces, the Mustang and the Opportunity trace, and we looked at different characteristics of the workload, like things like job characteristics, like in terms of how many cores they allocate, how long they ran, uh, workload heterogeneity, like diurnal patterns, job submission rates. Resource utilization, do the overcommit resources, interval period distributions, things like that, and of course a failure analysis. Um, I don't expect you to go through all this. Um, the point that I want to make, and the thing that was interesting to me, is that when we compare these workloads, we expected that the business analytics cluster here in Two Sigma and Google would be similar. If you imagine MapReduce and Spark on the one side and HPC workloads on the other side, you would expect to see a difference there. What we ended up seeing is that what the private cluster was running was closer to Mustang and Trinity as opposed to Google. There were a few differences. Um, higher job submission rates at Two Sigma. Um, higher failure rates, I'll talk about failure. I'm, not, I'm very sensitive to the, tick, tick, yeah. Means tick means that, um, for example, jobs were small in Google, uh, but they were a lot bigger, for example, in the other three clusters. I'll give a few examples of that. It's all in the paper. Um, but so one thing that I want to say here is that there's a lot more failures, if you want to call them failures, in Two Sigma and Google. I, I, I very, it's a very sensitive word, failure. Um, it's more that jobs that did not end with like everything went okay. That doesn't mean that you lost work. I'll talk about this. Yes. Uh, just take exception to the fact that you're saying only the Google trace is available. Last year we put out a large trace of um, Azure Compute. Was it all the, the VMs? The resource central one. Yeah. Yes, interesting. Okay, so this is not. This is just. We don't talk about failures though, because Azure yeah. doesn't fail. So we were. <laughs> so that's why I feel very weird. about and I'm gonna. I, I took it out of the paper. I just didn't take it out of the slide. Um, that I, I tried to, to to talk about them as unsuccessful jobs, but even that's a weird word. Um, yeah. And uh, I'll try to talk about this. I'm, I'm realizing what the time is. I might. I'll try to get to that. But you might want to take a look at that one because. So. Some of the issues here are similar in a sense. So that was published in this week. Let's talk more about this offline. But yeah, we looked at that. There's certain things about the trace that we can't use as it is right now because it talks about VMs as an entire 
Yeah, I that's like the unit. What right. brushes were, yeah. Versus we want to see something more granular in the job, and I'll talk more about like what other information we need. Um, so job size, for example, I'm only going to talk about this because of time, and I'm going to move on through the rest of the slides faster. This is Google. This is CDF. X axis is the number of CPU cores in the job. This is a CDF of how many cores uh, went to like each one of Google's jobs. Um, you can see there's a difference. This is uh, two sigma, and these are the two LANL traces. Uh, jobs at Google are on average like three to four hundred six times smaller in terms of CPUs they allocate. Um, see, hedge fund. This is supposed to be two sigma. Um, so three times in two sigma, and four hundred times to compare to LANL. Um, why is this sort of thing important? Looking at these differences, right? There was work at published ADC, for example, where they were trying to solve head of line blocking. They looked at the Google trace. And they were basically saying, we want to avoid cases where like a small job is stuck behind you know, the elephant job, the big job. Um, and uh, the way that they ended up solving this problem is they were saying, I'm going to allocate part of my cluster for the small jobs, and then everything else is going to run the big jobs. And they ended up with, like I think for some of the, I think they looked at Google, the Google trace and they said something like 20% of the cluster needs to be allocated to small jobs. It's hard to do that when basically you have a lot bigger jobs here. Uh, you have to increase that fraction. And if you do this, you might not be able to run your big jobs at that point. Well, again, this might be speculation. But what I'm saying is that we need to take this, this work and like look at it again and, and sort of see how it applies to those other traces. Yes? So except for Google, do you know if the other three workloads were, were latency sensitive or throughput sensitive? Do you have like any idea of? Um, of how they compare in like the primary metrics. So the business analytics for two sigma are throughput sensitive. Okay, but in Google it's likely to be latency sensitive, right? Which is where your optimization for small jobs come in. It, it, why you want to if, I, if I'm not mistaken, um, it's both. Okay. Um, and I, what they were told, what I was told about that trace is that it's representative of, of like their workload across different clusters. Like it's like it's a representative cluster in that okay. it has it has user facing services, mm -hmm. but it also has batch analytics. Batch, okay. Yes. Sorry if I missed this earlier, but um, one tenth of a core being a job means that one core is running ten jobs, or yeah, they're time sharing. Okay. So gotcha. you can do that with Google's scheduler, yeah, or, or whatever it is. Makes sense. Yeah. So um, <coughs> doesn't this suggest that? So before you were talking about uh, file systems that applications have a say on, right? Doesn't this say the same thing about scheduling? That. Like the types of scheduling you should right. have yeah. depends on the kind of jobs you yeah. have to schedule. Yeah, yeah. And you're, I, just, you're just sort of pointing to the Delgado um, uh, yeah. uh, thing, and, right? they did, and saying, they, oh, did. they they probably make the wrong decision because they overfitted to this uh, trace. But you know, if I could, I like that because you're talking. If I could pick my scheduler based on the kinds I'm of. I'm trying to remember the paper where they talked about hyper scheduling, and I think it's like Eagle or something like that. Again, at ADC, a certain year. But yeah, I agree. Like we should be moving towards that. And I think Google themselves recognize that. I think they're still using Borg, but they had Omega for a while, which was like um, a distributed scheduler. Yeah, Omega was. Canceled. But but it was canceled. So some of the ideas made it into made Borg. It Borg, yes. Um, so okay, I'm gonna skip this job duration, similar stuff. Um, as this, I really want to just talk about this a little bit. That, like, I don't feel comfortable. I'm going to show all the slide and then not spend a lot of time on this. But you know, you have higher failure rates in Google and Two Sigma, but that doesn't mean that things are bad. Um, it's times when like you might have done enough work with that job and then you realize it's fine. I need to stop things and not stop allocating resources. And they have they kill the jobs at that point. So we've seen things like that happen in Google and Two Sigma. Um, with LANL, what happens, for example, they have a lot smaller failure rates because they spend a lot of time optimizing the workloads. It has to finish in order for them to get results most of the time. Not all the time. Turns out that's something they share. Um, but sort of one of the things that we talk about in the paper is defining what failure means is crucial. It's hard to talk about one type of failure when you look across multiple traces. And I try not to use the word failure, and I try, I'll take it out of these slides, and I'll try to find a better word for that. But <laughs> Google is 40%. Unsuccessful without yeah. any timeouts, though. Without any timeouts. Well, I mean, I'm going to talk about timeouts so in a second. It's 11:30. Okay. Yeah. Um, I haven't until 11:45, do I? Okay. Well, we're going to make it. Um, so yeah, uh, it's without timeouts. The thing that's different, for example, having looked at the traces, is um, for Lanol and Mustang, you see, like, you have they have they basically use the Slurm or the Moab schedulers. That's what's out there for HPC, and um, they, they record events like 
completion, uh, cancellation from a user, or maybe the admin canceled it to do maintenance, very rarely happening. Um, a failure that happened because of a not node failure or because of software failure. But sort of that's that's the thing you have. For Two Sigma, because it's something that they collected to give us, um, we only had failure. We had no idea whether it was software, hardware, or whatever else. For Google, there's a ton of things happening. Like you could have a job getting killed, you could have a job getting preempted, you could have a job failing, getting canceled. The majority of that, 40% you looked at, is killed. Um, but oftentimes it's not the full job that gets killed, right? It's the, the task tasks of the job, and then yeah. it gets recreated somewhere else, right? This is all jobs. So we, we merge the full job. Yeah. Um, but this is true, and then when you look at task failures, that's one of the things they were telling us. As soon as the master thing fails, or some task fails, we kill the master and then kill all the other tasks with it, even though they were doing progress. I see. Um, and Arda, what's, what's the state of, of the affairs in Azure? Do we know? Uh, in terms of, in Azure, you don't see jobs or tasks, right? You have VMs, mm -hmm. uh, and then VMs have a certain failure um, rate I that see. So you measure VM about. failure, then you're thinking about failures. Yeah, you, you look at uh, sort of VMs that rebooted, VMs that needed to be uh, healed, and so forth. Mm -hmm. I see. And the assumption is that any job submitted, oh, oh, whatever happens inside the VM is yeah. like a black box. Nobody, right? So, in terms of healing events or like failure events, is it important to trace those released in any way? Uh, no. Okay. It might make more sense for Bing though. Bing might have stuff like jobs and batch analytics, basically, is what you're talking Bing about. Bing yeah. has a like a what we call a multi tenancy thing where it schedules yarn and uh, sort of in the Yarn and HDFS stack, okay. um, where we could look at those statistics. Yeah. Those are not very uh, sensitive. We could find that if you want to. Yeah, that would be great. Um, so, so one of the things, one of the reasons I'm talking about failures here and how sensitive we need to be to that word is because um, if you look at literature that tries to build models that predict failures, they do nothing to try and just determine is this a software failure or hardware failure. The first thing we do is those traits and say, if this is a hardware failure in HPC, you should be able to see it increasing, like you know, based on whatever the MTTF or whatever you have, increasing as you increase the size of the job, right? And you could see that for hardware failures. And then as soon as you pack the software failures in it, it's just a random distribution. Mm -hmm. um, and so most of the publications that are out there because they don't have access to the separation. And we only had access to like for nine months of Mustang, they gave us like node failures of separate events to do this test. But it's hard to collect it across the entire trace right now. We're trying to change that. Um, for the other ones, we have no information over that. And then you have models that are out there in the literature that just look at failures at large, but I feel like they're trying to optimize to one specific trace they looked at. Mm -hmm. And that's another reason why we need to have more traces out there. The, all these things would sort of like become obvious when people have to test their models across multiple yeah. traces. To me, sorry, go ahead. No, what I was going to say is that I, I, I think the data here might be a little biased in the sense that at Google, because they have so much spare capacity, just starting a job Absolutely. costs nothing. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And the job yes. is going to go wherever there's yeah. capacity available, and five minutes into it, if they decide you know, yeah. this is not looking good, they just kill it. For the other, the other thing, right, you have to queue your job for yes. days or hours. And so it's, people are a lot more careful about what they start. Absolutely. Right? This, is, this is spot on. Um, so for Google, that's exactly what's happening. Any engineer can do a batch job. You do the best effort. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, so what else? There's other things. Oh, timeouts. You notice timeouts. Yeah. So there's this thing where, like, if a job runs more than just the maximum uh, runtime that they have in national labs, it gets killed. And so the interesting thing that we saw, we keep seeing it as we look at more clusters, is that about half the CPU time on those machines end up ends up in a timeout. But calm down. It's not lost work. Um, I'm pretty sure it's not. But this would be a scandal if it was. But we still want to see, like, when does this happen? You know, is there any job that is work that is, lo that is lost? If they checkpoint their work, that still means that if your checkpoint frequency is like two hours, you might have lost the last two hours. All right, so that's, that's still a lot. Which leads me, leads me to the second uh, case study with these traces, like predicting job run times. Maybe that's a way to sort of like predict timeouts by seeing how long something's going to last. Right, right now, the way we come up with runtime estimates is we look, we either ask, ask the user to give us an estimate. That's mostly inaccurate. Um, because they 
not, not a, on purpose most of the time. Uh, and the second thing is lower job repeats like Rayon and Hadoop. Just look at similar jobs around in the past and just repeat that measurement. I mentioned this already, like a lot of the time goes to timeouts for the two clusters we have. I keep seeing this number come up again and again for different clusters. There was this work that was published in Eurosys earlier this year where the where basically three sigma to, to explain this very simply without spending too much time on this is it generates estimates automatically by basically looking at all the features you have uh, for the scheduler in order and, and it generates multiple models essentially, right? Um, and it will try to make a prediction based on each model using all your historical data, rank those models based on their accuracy, and then pick the one with the highest accuracy for your next prediction. And after you've made the prediction, next time it takes that prediction, feeds it into the historical data, and reshuffles those experts and finds the new expert and uses that next time and so on and so forth. So it's adaptive like that. Is three sigma just two sigma but better? Or <laughs> <laughs> it was done using the two sigma traces, yes. Um, so it's just the name of the scheduler. I mean, it doesn't imply that the two sigma is using it either. It's a name they came up with. Um, so we looked at the accuracy when you make estimates through that three sigma, um, just the prediction part that they have. And so this is for percentage of jobs across clusters. Initially, when we became part of this project, um, they only had one trace, the Google trace that looked at, and everything was just peachy. Um, this is Google. Right, the blue line, and then we gave them the other traces, and we start we start seeing interesting things. So, the, you want to be around zero to your estimate error is like close to like zero, um, and overestimations can happen. They're not the worst thing in the world in that like you might schedule a job and it might finish earlier, and all of a sudden you have more resources available to you. So then you can adapt to that. Underestimations are bad. Um, that's the point where you end up allocating resources for longer than you expected to. And so the interesting thing is that when we use multiple traces. You might notice that the one that does the worst here is Trinity, for example. The one that does the best here is like Mustang. So you have different traces sort of like performing differently. Sort of looking into what is the thing that actually uh, works and doesn't work each time. And what we found is that typically what works well is when you collect something like a job name. Um, so what a job name is essentially like some sort of representation of like the executable it ran, the parameters that it ran with. If you have something like that even hashed, which is what Google has, that allows you to see repeats of a job. Trinity didn't have that at all, right? They just cut off that field because we got that trace so fast um, and everything was sensitive. Um, so that, it didn't work there. So logical job names matter. Um, the other things that got picked out was the user ID and the number of cores. I'm personally not very uh, fond of the user ID being a thing that people use to predict what is going to happen in the future for the obvious reason, uh, privacy. But the other reason is also that it's not a transferable model. Right? As soon as you have a different set of users, can't do anything about it. Which leads me to the third thing we're looking at, right? the user behavior, um, and trying to refine our predictions using that. So there's interesting things. This is from, from the Mustang trace for one user in one specific job, because we have job names for that. Um, this is the lifetime, part of the lifetime of that job. Right? So they start, they run that job with a few nodes, like six nodes, 31 very large time limit. I think this is the max, like 16 hours. It runs for a while, runs for three hours or so, and then it gets canceled by the user. Right, so clearly they saw something wrong there. They went away, three weeks later, same job gets submitted, um, more cores, much smaller timeout at this point. So they, I think they're testing it out. And it fails in three seconds. They submit it again, it runs for 901 seconds, it gets timed out because it gets killed. Um, and then they say, okay, clearly this is supposed to work. Increase the timeout. They missed it by two seconds, it turns out. Um, it completes successfully. And then they get sort of like um, happy with the result and they start increasing the, the number of nodes more. All right, so you have sort of a, a behavior there. But what's interesting to me about this specific snapshot is that it shows you that not all failures are bad things. Right? If this is a debug cycle, a failure there is a learning experience. Right? This is part of that learning experience. So like, it's okay to let users have jobs fail. Um, what we're looking for is failures that are not happening in this context. So we try to do this, and we try to have, this is ongoing work that one of my students is doing, is building models that generalize below across clusters, maybe across organizations. We're trying to see sort of how much we can push this idea. Um, right now, existing work builds models that are targeted specific clusters. And that's mainly, if, if you're on the research side, that's because there's scarcity of data. If you're on the industry side, it's because, well, you're looking at your data, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, 
And, or, or it uses unavailable features as prediction time. We've had cases like that where we'll predict you know, whether a job's going to fail based on its duration. Um, so we'd like to avoid things like that. Um, and we'd like to see models that, that adapt to workload changes. That five-year trace we have, we see a lot of changes in the workload that are like, you know, very significant. So you need a different model for that. Um, we've moved from like, so I have numbers here for just three of the models we're toying with, like logistic regression and random forest and LSTM that we're playing around with. And so we're able to sort of, this, this is very preliminary results. And so we trained it with Mustang, um, and we optimized it here, the LSTM that is, and then we just ported it to all the other ones. And so it was able to perform like pretty well. Um, this is average, I, mean, I hate averages. But basically, like, it, was, it performed fairly well for the other traces given that it hadn't looked at them. Right? Um, there's more we can do to this. Again, it's preliminary results. We haven't like, tuned it to find user behaviors. I'd like to do that and then like, take the model apart and try to interpret it. Um, why, why is this so important? Why, why is it so important level? to be general? Why can't you train for, presumably One. you're spending hundreds of millions on these machines, right? Doing yeah. some training to do better at scheduling or whatever shouldn't be a deal, right? So I think we're moving towards a point where uh, we want to have these things be part of actual systems, right? You want, you want to have a, a, learn, a model like that be part of your scheduler. And when you do that, well, one is you need to be interpretable enough that the administrator or whoever is using it can understand what the hell is happening. Yeah, and the other part of it is it's hard to say that in most environments like that, you'll have a data analyst at the, like ready to sort of like create a model that's optimized for your workload. So if you had something that's more general, you'd be able to have every company, like private companies that are smaller, like Two Sigma, um, use it as well as like HPC, as well as like bigger companies that can develop this without even having enough data to test it out. Because sometimes that might not even also not be available to you. So I'm not talking about models that are generalizable in that they know everything. It's just that they start with some prior knowledge of how workloads, how to behave uh, when they see a specific workload, and then they could be tuned to your workload over time. And you could go and optimize that. Um, but you know, if, if you do that, you, you'll see things like this uh, two sigma a um, thing, right? Where depending on which model you generate, accuracy is going to be, you know, not great. Yeah, and sometimes one of the things that I'm grappling with is the notion that you might get or random accuracy, and that you might do great, but that's just because it so happened that you did great for this yeah. part of the trace. Um, but I think trying to sort of understand what it is that are, here's the thing. So something that's general, that, but, but then gets uh, improved locally at the whatever site you, you care about now, I guess would be a better approach, right. right? But I mean, okay, my sort of underlying goal with all of this is that I want to understand user behaviors in systems. And that's because of things that we saw before. Mm -hmm. and. One of the things that we saw, like that we see high timeouts again and again and again, and no one can explain to me why this is happening, except like this random admin that I talked to at some point. The personal communication just told me, we tell people just like if they can't code a stopping criterion well enough, let it run until it fails and then run it again from your checkpoint. Right? So it's like, and when you see 50% of the people doing that and 50% of the people doing things a different way, it becomes like a culture thing. Mm -hmm. So I want to see what other interesting behaviors are out there in these systems that we haven't seen. Um, by Having a model that succeeds in being general and then like taking it apart, mm -hmm. um, or maybe learn something else. Who knows? Yes. And so, so you're saying like sysadmins need to like interpret these models just to understand what's going on in their system potentially, or or to just make them feel comfortable trusting us to use them. Okay. Right. And they're 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 understanding these LSTMs, or what are they? So what you can so if you make these LSTMs simple enough. Because you could say, I'm going to have an arbitrary number, I'm going to do a grid search and like have an arbitrary number of like layers and find the best model for my workload. It's going to be this complicated mess, potentially. Versus, like, can I limit it, can I strip it down to a certain point where it's simple enough? Um, and then have different ways to sort of like insert weights um, or something that, I'm talking about attention, for example. Uh, attention weights in different parts of those uh, states, or like those, uh, those layers. They'll, Tell me, what was it the weight that actually produced this prediction? What, what is it the weight, what is the part of this computation here in the LSTM that affects my end result more? Um, so that, that's what I mean in terms of understanding. And you could do this a lot easier if it's like a simpler model. Um, I don't know if it's going to be a simpler model. Like this is I mean, if this becomes all heuristic, then why not just use logistic? Or, you know. Why not use a random forest? 
Or right. like the a decision most, yeah. tree. Right. Right. Yeah. Yes. Forest seems you can do variable importance and. Yes. Yeah. Um, but so far we haven't seen random forests be able to adapt across worlds. It's a very random thing. You can train them very well for like one workload and then you transfer it to another one and something right. will happen. I don't know what. And I guess it, if you want to do, if you want to update your model yeah. on your own system, then, then a network is a good thing. Yes. You can easily exactly. do it. Uh, but you're right in that, like, the random forest is great because you can do, like, you can see Gini indices and whatever, and you can see, you can rank the variables based on how well they're doing and say this is the thing that actually resulted in this accuracy. But it doesn't transfer. Um, okay. But again, this is ongoing work. It's like just putting it out there, um, and there's a lot more to do in this space, I think. Um, that's it. I think I'm done pretty, pretty, pretty close to my time, which is, like, a surprising thing. Um, but. That's, that's basically it. So there's two projects that I described here. Um, and one is, I talked, to, I talked to the th about the first one is sort of like the, from the storage perspective. There might be other perspectives we could look at, right? Like caching, for example. And like, do we ha can we expose like potential caching policies to the application itself to let it have control over that? Um, finding an, the right interface to express in situ computation, I think, is like sort of one of our highest priorities right now. Deciding what should be done as in situ computation, what shouldn't. When I say in situ, don't just think about our pipeline. Uh, think about the programmable NICs that I mentioned before. What can you do on them? And there's work happening in that space. I'm not saying we're the first ones to explore that, right? Like SOSP had a whole track or something. Not, not a track, a whole session um, earlier this last year um, looking at that. But they did things like, for example, if you have a key value store, is there certain keys that are hot that you could cache on your NICs? So you don't have to go all the way across the network. Um, we're talking about more stuff, more, more specific, specific stuff like that. Like, can you do filtering? Um, anyway, okay. And the autonomic cluster management. I use the word autonomic to sort of as a as a, as a hom um, homage to like autonomic computing that was happening. What was it like 10, 20 years ago? Um, that's basically it. Thank you very much. Thank you for asking questions during, by the way. I didn't have to say that. I forget to say that sometimes. <laughs> awesome. Thank you.